Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash WTech. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Moving the needle. Welcome to the Washington Tech Policy Podcast. Curating communications, media, and tech policy news so you don't have to. News, interviews, everything you need without the axe to grind. It's the Washing Tech Policy Podcast with Joe Miller. The FCC moves to stimulate set-top box competition. Diversity finally gets to the top of the commission's agenda. And NYU's Charlton McElwain is my guest. It was a busy week at the FCC. The commission held its open meeting on Thursday, and in advance of this year's presidential election, the commission adopted rules requiring essentially every kind of mass media entity under its authority to post their public and political files online going forward, but not worry about all of the hard copy filings they've made over many years already. The commission will take care of uploading those. The rule applies to cable operators, satellite TV providers, and broadcast radio and satellite licensees, but not cable systems with fewer than 1,000 subscribers. For those cable systems with between 1,000 and 5,000 subscribers, the rules kick in in 2018. Also, the new rules will only apply to broadcasters in the top 50 markets with five or more employees until 2018, when the rule kicks in for all broadcasters. The commission also proposed rules designed to improve the emergency alert system, EAS. The proposals seek to increase the involvement of state and local officials and support more testing and awareness of the EAS and make sure communities receive needed information in the event of an emergency. After the open meeting, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler held a press conference during which he announced that he has circulated a proposed rulemaking which would free up competition in the set-top box market. For years, consumers have been required to rent set-top boxes provided to them by the cable companies at rates averaging $231 per year, according to a new study conducted by Senators Ed Markey and Richard Blumenthal. Citing Public Knowledge and Consumer Federation of America data, Chairman Wheeler also noted during the press conference that set-top box prices have grown by 185%, while computers and mobile phone prices have moved in the other direction, declined by 85 The chairman's proposal would open competition in the set-top box market to other device manufacturers and innovators, giving consumers a choice as to which set-top box is right for them. Interestingly, Wheeler is an alumnus of the cable industry as he served in the 70s and 80s as president and CEO of the Industry Trade Association, NCTA, as well as CTIA, the Wireless Industry Association, in the 90s and aughts. However, the cable industry is pushing back, saying the proposal on circulation is the same as a failed proposal from 2010 called AllVid. The set-top box proposal has tremendous diversity implications as well. It is supported by Robert Johnson, founder of BET, because of the potential for set-top box competition to improve the visibility of programmers not included in channel lineups. And Alex Nogales, head of the National Hispanic Media Coalition, also supports the proposal because of the effect the proposal could have on the price of set-top boxes. But the proposal is not supported by TV One's Alfred Liggins, who is co-chairing a 47-member coalition with Nomi Bergman of Bright House. The coalition is opposing any changes to the current set-top box regime. Refusing to back down from calling the proposal all vid, Liggins said, quote, the all vid proposal is a brazen money grab by big tech companies that would do severe damage to the programming ecosystem and in particular niche and minority focused networks, end quote. Further, Wheeler's press conference took place the day after Byron Allen filed a $10 billion lawsuit against the FCC and Charter Communications claiming, quote, racial discrimination in contracting for channel coverage, end quote. Allen said, quote, President Obama and the Democratic Party have completely excluded the African-American community when it comes to economic inclusion. Everyone talks about diversity, but diversity in Hollywood and the media starts with ownership. 
African Americans don't need handouts and donations. We can hire ourselves if white corporate America does business with us in a fair and equitable way. He said, a driving purpose of the Federal Communications Act and the First Amendment is to ensure the widest possible dissemination of information from diverse sources. Yet the FCC has done nothing to protect the voices of African-American-owned media companies in the face of increased media consolidation, end quote. In an apparent reference to Charter's recent diversity MOU with several civil rights organizations, Allen also said, quote, The FCC's apparent standard operating procedure is to obtain and accept sham diversity commitments from merger applicants in excess of its statutory duties, end quote. Allen recently sued AT&T and DirecTV for $10 billion, which resulted in a carriage deal. The set-top box proposal is expected to be voted on at the next open meeting scheduled for February 18th, where the FCC is also expected to begin looking at, quote, the principal obstacles that independent programmers face in obtaining carriage on its video distribution, end quote. A lot of quotes and end quotes there. Got to stay on top of this stuff. Sorry about that. The FCC also released its 2016 Broadband Progress Report, which concludes broadband is not being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. The commission found 34 million Americans still lack access to high-speed internet, defined as 25 megabits per second down and 3 megabits per second up. 40% of people living in rural areas and on tribal lands still lack access, and 41% of schools have not met the FCC's short-term connectivity goals to support digital learning applications, according to the Commission's press release. The Commission also found that no satellite broadband services met the speed threshold and that there remains a need to define what the speed threshold should be for mobile broadband. The FTC, Federal Trade Commission, has announced improvements to IdentityTheft.gov, where identity theft victims can go to build a personalized recovery plan. The site is designed as a one-stop shop, and the FTC says it is now, quote, integrated with the FTC's consumer complaint system, allowing consumers who are victims of identity theft to rapid file a complaint with the FTC and then get a personalized guide to recovery that helps streamline many of the steps involved, end quote. Last year, the FTC saw a 47% increase in consumer identity theft complaints compared to 2014. The Justice Department says as many as 17.6 million Americans were identity theft victims in 2014. That website, again, is identitytheft.gov. The Wall Street Journal reported that Telkom, the largest telecommunications provider in Indonesia, which is the world's fourth most populous country, has blocked Netflix. Telkom is state-owned. The company said it objected to violent and adult content on Netflix, which the Indonesian Film Censorship Board recently stated failed to meet Indonesian content regulations. Netflix stated it is not required to apply for content permits like cable networks, but says it intends to comply with Indonesian laws where applicable. Kevin Martin, the FCC chairman who now works at Facebook, spoke about FCC's Free Basics program at the State of the Net conference last week. The Free Basics program provides individuals in Africa, Asia, and Latin America who are unable to afford broadband with free access to certain services and applications which do not count against data caps. This not counting against data caps piece is what is known as zero rating. And we have also seen zero rating in the context of video programming, such as T-Mobile's Binge On and Comcast's Stream TV, which offers zero rating for services that sign an agreement with the companies ahead of time. Some net neutrality advocates have lashed out against zero rating programs because they believe they are simply designed to evade the commission's net neutrality rules. However, Martin noted that the net neutrality rules do not confront zero rating head on with a bright line rule and instead allow the commission to evaluate zero rating services on a case by case basis. Finally, Verizon released its transparency report. It found that U.S. law enforcement officials made 139,569 demands for user data in the second half of 2015, with fewer than half coming from subpoenas. Stay with us.
For you, my dear listeners of the Washington Tech Policy Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You'll be amazed at how much time Audible will save you. It saved me so much time. I can do these podcasts and read actual books to my kids. Why not listen at the gym, in the car, or on your morning run? How about Between the World and Me by ta Coates? You can download Between the World and Me or another audiobook free by trying audible.com. Sign up for your free audiobook and a 30-day trial today at audibletrial.com forward slash WTech. My guest today is Dr. Charlton McElwain, Associate Professor of Media, Culture, and Communication at NYU. As a researcher, writer, and teacher, his primary interests focus broadly on issues of race and media, particularly within the social and political arena. His previous work centered on how political candidates construct, mobilize, benefit, or suffer damage from race-based appeals. In 2011, he co-authored the book Race Appeal, How Candidates Invoke Race in U.S. Political Campaigns. In 2012, the book won the prestigious Ralph Bunch Award given by the American Political Science Association for the best book addressing ethnic pluralism. The same year, the American Library Association recognized the book as one of the best of the best books among academic publishers. In addition to authoring, co-authoring four additional books and close to 30 scholarly journal articles and chapters in edited volumes and regularly providing expert commentary for local, state, national, and international media, he continues to pursue research about racial appeals through collaborative work focused on analyses of individuals' real-time perceptions of race-based appeals in political advertising, as well as a variety of cognitive physiological responses to racialized communication. His recent interests have turned to the intersections of race and digital media, and he has a number of projects in the works, including an article entitled Racial Formation Online, a book project titled Digital Movement, and a related project analyzing the Black Lives Matter movement on Twitter. Please welcome Charlton McElwain. Charlton, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here with you. So today our focus is on race and the internet, which is in and of itself a very broad topic because it includes issues related to the racially charged political dialogue we often read ourselves or hear about happening on sites like Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, and Instagram, but also looking at ways in which search engines construct their algorithms, such as in the case of Google returning search results of African-American people being labeled gorillas, or AdWords links to services that conduct criminal background checks happening more frequently for African-American sounding names. We're also hearing more and more cases of racial issues arising in the context of commerce sites like Craigslist and Airbnb. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to go into as much depth as I'd like to in the short time we have, but I do want to give the audience a sense for how the issue of race and the internet has developed over time and evolved from being phenomena that five to 10 years ago were very hard to articulate to really being something that scholars are beginning to examine in a data-driven way. So thank you for joining me. All right. I'm looking forward to it. So let's start with the history of the issue of race and the internet. What do we know, Charlton, about race, discrimination, and exclusion, and how it works online? How exactly has this issue evolved? It's a good question. A good place to start really is with the the history. Um, you know, if we go back to the essentially the dawn of the internet, or what we know as the uh, sort of commercial internet uh, of the early uh, '90s. Back then, the discussion was really about the digital divide, what we call the the digital divide, and it was about the differential access between people of color and whites who did not have access to the hardware, the software, uh, the tools necessary to connect online. Uh, And that discourse uh, continued uh, for quite a while, and that was really the, the dominant way uh, that we structured our conversations about race uh, and the internet uh, at the time. And so despite that, there were, and despite the fact that African Americans, uh, Latinos, uh, to a lesser degree, uh, Asian Americans um, were 
largely absent from the online world in those uh, early days, there were still enough that scholars uh, were able to understand something about the role that race played, even in those uh, early times. And so when you look at the scholarship at the time, what people focused on were the fact that people often uh, sort of masqueraded in terms of their racial identity. Uh, so these are the times where, you know, the idea of anonymity was really uh, a selling point about the internet. You, uh, no one knew who you were, no one knew your real identity. And it was, a, it was an interesting moment because on the one hand, people said, you know, this is, this is liberating. This is democratizing. Here we have a medium where no one can really discriminate because no one knows what you look like. No one knows your skin color. Uh, and so unless you tell someone, unless you reveal, uh, they don't have that information that we commonly rely on to, to discriminate against people based on their, uh, their race, their color, their gender, or any other form of uh, identity. But so what, what happened during that time was uh, there was a lot of uh, what we might call kind of identity play. And that identity play frequently was in the form of folks who masqueraded in the identity of people of color, uh, who held themselves out to be African American or Asian or some form of exotic uh, identity. And what people focused on when that happened was the idea that when people took on those identities, they performed them in ways that really were consistent with our longstanding prejudices and stereotypes about these varying groups. Uh, and so e uh, early on, from day one really, we get a real sense that race is online in some fashion, even though for those first few years we were really thinking about and the common uh, sort of discussion about the internet is this is a liberating place, this is a place where race doesn't matter, uh, this is a colorblind uh, space. Uh, so that's, that's where uh, sort of things really begin with uh, scholars and others really kind of lifting the veil and saying, look, race does live here. And so you had people masquerading in those kind of uh, ways, uh, things that a professor named Lisa Nakamura called identity tourism. Uh, the idea that I could sort of wear another's identity and see what it would be like to be them, but always to be like them corresponded to those uh, stereotypes. So that was one way. Uh, the other way was that people found it useful in those early days of the internet to talk about race, and particularly the few, uh, relative few African Americans and people of color online were online precisely because they wanted to think about, pursue, discuss, find other people who were interested in communicating about racial issues, whether that happened to be race related to uh, popular culture in some way, around music, around hip-hop, around uh, certain celebrities, actors, or what have you, or to discuss racial issues, affirmative action, many of the common uh, things of the day, racial inequality. These are days when, uh, you know, right after uh, and around Rodney King, and so thinking about those types of uh, things going on in the political landscape. Uh, the Million Man March, this is right around that time. And so you have, on the one hand, uh, at the very beginning, groups of people who said, look, race does not live here. This is a raceless, colorblind space. No one knows who you are. No one knows your identity. No one discriminates. And we're going to keep it that way because that's good. On the other hand, you have people that said, oh, this is a place where I can find other people. I can find other people of color, and I can communicate with others who share my experience, who share my outlook. I can learn about my history. I can have access to online uh, content that tells me more about my history in ways that I never discovered. Uh, and so you had these 
dimensions, uh, contradictory dimensions in some way, present online at that uh, very early time. What are your thoughts, Charlton, on the ways in which technology continues to perpetuate the same discrimination that we saw prior to the Civil Rights Movement? I mean, we had the Civil Rights Act, which basically outlawed clear instances of discrimination, instances of segregation, where it was clearly apparent that individuals were being discriminated against. Now we've moved into a new era. How would you describe that era, and how would you describe the role of technology there? Well, it's interesting. I think that when we look at the role of technology and its intersection with race, what we're starting to see really more and more is that uh, our, our sort of technological online connected life, digital connected life, begins to mirror our offline life, both historically and uh, in our contemporary uh, in contemporary day. Um, and so what I mean by that is, is this. We, you, you talked about sort of uh, pre-civil rights movement uh, and some of those earlier times, and you had two forms of discrimination, and, uh, essentially. You had the very overt, explicit forms of bigotry, uh, name calling, um, from name calling to various forms of race based uh, violence uh, and outward explicit forms of discrimination. Uh, but we also had uh, were kind of uh, institutionalized discrimination, which was a little bit different. So these are actors who discriminate, but not in a sense where I can pinpoint exactly who or someone who is uh, actively. Uh, and consciously motivated to discriminate, uh, but it is a way in which our institutions work. And so when we think about affirmative action, affirmative action policy came about because uh, people saw that in the no normal course of work or employment, it didn't take someone saying, I don't like black people, I don't like Latino people, and I don't want to hire them by people just acting the way they normally do, hiring people the way they normally would through uh, the grapevine or their own personal networks, it disadvantaged certain groups of people. And so when we think about uh, fast forward 40, 50 years into our current um, day in our technological environment, I think we start are starting to see more and more instances of the two forms of discrimination. So number one, I think we're seeing an increase, uh, if you will, in the kind of overt expressions, explicit uh, expressions of bigotry and discrimination. Uh, and so, for instance, uh, uh, you know, we can think about today uh, with uh, the, the rhetoric of Donald Trump and those who uh, follow him online and post uh, uh, both comments, images, videos, etc., that mimic his uh, remarks about Mexican Americans or uh, immigrants from Mexico or uh, from other uh, areas of uh, of the world, and uh, thinking about them fundamentally as criminals, as lazy people, as people that are a drain on uh, our economy, that threaten uh, our national identity, and so the online environment has become a way in which that kind of rhetoric can circulate and persist. And it finds an audience and it finds a home. And sometimes that home is among people who remain or try to remain anonymous. But more and more, it's a home among people that are starting to feel more emboldened to express their views that are consistent with those uh, sort of bigoted attitudes uh, and so forth. You know, we can we can all remember both in the 2008 election, 2012 election uh, of President Obama, uh, when even on, uh, you know, if we just focused on election night, when circulation on Twitter, on uh, uh, in, in uh, other forums, platforms like uh, Facebook and so forth, uh, the use of the, the N-word in connection with Barack Obama that uh, really skyrocketed. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence and data showing not only uh, the, the increase in that kind of rhetoric, but also sort of the geography and where uh, the people uh, were living that were communicating these kinds of things. Um, and then 
the the mountain of imagery online that was posted um, during those elections, images that depicted Obama as uh, as a mon- uh, monkey, as an ape, as a terrorist, uh, every uh, kind of derogatory image you can imagine. And so when we think about uh, kind of moving ahead a little bit, you mentioned the uh, the Google uh, incident recently mm-hmm. where their algorithms had tagged a photo of an African-American couple uh, when, as a result of a search uh, for a gorilla, I believe it was. And people ask, you know, how does that happen? How can that happen? And one of the things that that reflects is not only – uh, something about Google's search algorithm and the way that it uh, tags content online and does so in an automatic uh, fashion. But it also reveals uh, the extent to which content, racially discriminatory um, content, explicitly racially prejudiced uh, content proliferates online. So that the likelihood when you search for certain people, mm-hmm. These are the things that come up because people have tagged them uh, in such a way because they have used these terms and images and circulated them to such a great volume uh, that this is what comes out. And so it reveals a lot about those of us who spend a a good bit, bit of time online what people are interested in and in what, you know, I'm saying as a kind of uptick in this kind of explicit bigotry. It used to be 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, we were in an era where at least in the the political sphere and even beyond, there were still bigots in the world. There were people that still were not on board with the idea of racial inequality, but they sort of knew enough to kind of keep that to themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they felt like uh, if I express this, there will be some backlash. People won't accept me. People think I'm a bad person. People think I'm a bigot, a racist, or what have you. Uh, And more and more what we're seeing, I think, in part as a result of um, technology and uh, the Internet, is that people are feeling more and more emboldened to speak their minds, especially when their minds are – uh, uh, full of these kinds of uh, prejudices and so forth. Right. I just wonder if the if the folks who would have been the uh, racist bigots of the of a previous generation, if those folks feel more emboldened than the folks who are trying to work against it, uh, like the folks on Black Twitter. Mm-hmm. I wonder if the consequences are more uh, for people of color when they speak out than they are. Uh, for um, other individuals, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think we're in a, a in a moment where we're seeing a kind of uh, uh, you know a battle, if you will, between those two kind of sides. So, on the one hand, you have people I think who are emboldened uh, and they find a home and they are able to find spaces and places online uh, to find people like them that uh, kind of traffic in this kind of. Uh, hateful, prejudicial, discriminatory uh, rhetoric, uh, and they find like-minded people and circulate that. Uh, You also have those same folks that begin to encroach on other spaces um, uh, that that troll uh, the sites that people of color uh, dominate uh, in order to ridicule and extend their, their, their misguided beliefs and perceptions and so forth. In those spaces where people of color uh, dominate and uh, can be intimidated. Uh, So on the one hand, you do have that. On the other, uh, you do have uh, ways, and I think this is one of the uh, the positive uh, aspects of the internet and the tools that it provides uh, in a kind of democratic way. uh, Is that you have a you know something of a a black Twitter, um, as you mentioned. Uh, where you see a different kind of phenomenon. That is, you see people who uh, may not know each other, uh, but they share a common bond in, uh, you know, in racial identity or in uh, a particular view about uh, racial politics, and using the same tools that are uh, used by some to discriminate and to inflame 
uh, using words and imagery and so forth, they can respond. And so, uh, you know, I'm thinking about uh, a, a moment uh, on Twitter recently uh, when there was discussion about Black Lives Matter and someone spoke up and began to say a lot about, uh, you know, why can't we say all lives matter or why don't we say white lives matter? And people began to sort of troll uh, folks and saying, look, you guys are the ones that are bigots when you say Black Lives Matter. And what you saw uh, was not people cowering or being intimidated. You had folks that really galvanized to shut those people down and to to respond to, in some ways, to ridicule, to rebuke, and also explain uh, what it means. But my point is you you have a way in which people can communicate and do so in a kind of mass way to say, look, we will not be – intimidated by your racial rhetoric, and we can respond, and here's a platform in which we do. And so the question of whether one is drowning out the other, I think, is is an open uh, question. Uh, but I think the interesting the thing that I see is the ways in which people are mobilizing or putting uh, online tools to use uh, for their varying interests and, and purposes. So what are the risks, Charlton, in terms of not continuing to study this? You know, what are the what what is the urgency that require that requires us to continue looking at race in the context of the internet and what's the theoretical approach that you think would be most suitable for that type of scholarship? Thanks uh, uh for that question. I you know, I think the risk here is really one of naivete. I know that people like to sort of say uh color doesn't matter, or I don't see color, or uh, you know, I don't have any racial uh, biases or things of that nature. Um, and that's true offline, uh, but it's also, I think, in a, a very strong way true of our online environment, which we have, as I said before, historically thought of as an egalitarian place. Uh, I can go anywhere online and no one's going to stop me. Uh, I can do anything online that I'm that the technology enables me to do, and no one's going to uh, stop me. Um, if I want to be anonymous, I can be um, to a certain degree. And so people think. Uh, yeah, I think we've gotten to a point where people think that uh, race does not exist online in any uh, a sort of real way. Or if they do it, they see it as only these explicit forms of bigotry in ways that is easy to say, well, look, that's just uh, some extremists out there, but that's not me. And this technology is still a uh, kind of a race neutral uh, space. Um, and so I think the more that our um, everyday lives are tethered to the online environment, it behooves us to try to understand ways in which race discrimination uh, particularly those subtle forms of discrimination uh, occur online in ways that may have real harm, in ways that really uh, may disadvantage uh, certain groups over others. And so I think what we, we have to do theoretically, and as an, as an academic, as a researcher uh, over the last few years really trying to think about this, the question is really how do we understand – it's easy to see – bad actors online. Um, it's easy to see the way in which people do racist things online with the tools that are available to them. Uh, the question I've been trying to ask really is, can we think about the internet uh, in a different way and say, can we think about the internet as being fundamentally racist? Uh, and I know that probably off, uh, puts a lot of people off when I put it that way, but what I mean to say is, in the same way that we might say banks uh, as an institution systemically discriminates, that is, it systemically delivers outcomes that favor certain groups uh, more than others. Is there a way in which the internet does the same thing or can do uh, the same thing? And so I think we've got to be able to figure out a way of understanding how um, this kind of online discrimination, if we want to call it that, uh, we might talk about uh, this idea of disparate impact or 
what in the legal world is the way of saying, here's someone who's not intentionally discriminating against me or a group of people, but by virtue of the way that uh, system works, the outcomes really favor or disfavor one group above or over um, another. Um, and so the difficulty in this is, is many, uh, many fold for researchers like me. Number one, uh, as you know, it's hard to understand and identify race online. That is, you know, think about when, you, when you're on Facebook uh, and the mountains of information that Facebook asks me to uh, reveal about myself on a profile, uh, my religion, my political affiliation, my name, where I'm from, all of these things. It doesn't ask or give me the opportunity to identify my race or my color, my ethnic background. Twitter, LinkedIn, any of these social sites. Uh, and so there's no systematic way to account for race in ways that we think of offline. There's no census. Uh, there are no check boxes that we mandate people fill out. And so that makes it difficult to try to understand ways in which uh, race and racial discrimination might work systemically on the internet. The other difficulty is the sort of black box of algorithms that underlie the technology, whether it's about searching in a, a general Google search or whether it's searching for goods and services on a commercial uh, platform like an Amazon or a Yelp or something like that. And so I think what we've got to begin to do, which is uh, where research has started to, uh, to head at this point, is we start with what we, we've got. We test various platforms and see when we send two people out or we have two people set up a profile on a, a Craigslist or a site like Craigslist and we make explicit uh, the area or the address uh, where the seller is from and make sure that that address is uh, sort of coded racially. So it's in an area that's uh, generally thought of as being mostly black or mostly Latino or mostly white. Is there a differential outcome? Are people more likely to buy what that person is selling? Are they more willing to pay a higher price for that depending on who they perceive this person is and where they perceive this person lives and the value judgments that they make? And so uh, that's one case where some uh, research has begun to show that uh, there is a racially differential outcome, that people – uh, that view sellers as being uh, uh, non-white or living in places that are uh, highly uh, uh, consist of people of color, uh, that they trust them uh, less, that they're uh, only willing to pay uh, a, a little amount uh, for uh, what's being sold compared to, to whites or who they perceive as people living in better uh, neighborhoods. And so we have that outcome, at least, to start from, to begin asking questions then, how does this happen? And how does the technology, the platform itself, enable this kind of discriminatory practice to take place uh, and kind of work ourselves uh, backwards in that way? But one of the difficulties is, you know, uh, for someone like me who's not a – a technology person. I'm not a computer scientist. Um, you know, I know just enough uh, about uh, technology and computers to uh, get me in trouble, as they say. It's hard to ask questions when you don't have the skill or the knowledge about the underlying technology that feeds into it. Uh, and so I think one of the things that we as researchers have to do more and more is to essentially collaborate and pair up, to have people that understand the ways that algorithms work, uh, the way that they are developed, uh, the way in which they deliver certain forms of information or outcomes, to work with uh, folks like me who really have an, an expertise in understanding racial dynamics and uh, the way in which racial inequality uh, works. And pairing folks like up uh, like that up together to understand exactly how uh, race may work online in discriminatory ways. Um, and again, I think you know this is 
this is an open question. It's kind of a, a frontier, and uh, for folks like me that uh, uh, you know maybe a, a little pessimistic in saying the internet and online uh, life may not be uh, as race free as we would think it to be, or as some hold it out to be. Um, I think we're still not to the point where we can say. Uh, you know, the internet uh, or digital uh, media is fundamentally racist. I think it's still uh, an open question. We've really got to sort of grapple with, you know, if we're going to make that contention or try to understand if this is the case, how do we know what it looks like? How do we know where to find it? How do we know uh, what the symptoms of uh, this kind of discrimination might be and how they might uh, show themselves in this kind of uh, environment. Charlton, thank you so much for joining me. This has been truly enlightening. I'm only sorry we don't have more time, but I want to shift the conversation now, ask you a few more questions, and then we'll close. Sound like a plan? Sounds great. All right. This podcast is about policy, but it's also about what makes successful people tick and what we can learn about what constitutes success in the intellectual and policy spheres and how to generate greater, a greater sense of fulfillment in our work. So how about you, Charlton? What are some things, and they can be apps, they can be tools or habits, some things that you use to stay on top of your game? Uh, sure. I, um, I don't do too well with apps, but uh, uh, some sort of lifestyle and work uh, sort of uh, uh, tactics I use really that help me stay as productive as possible. Uh, number one, uh, I try to do this as much as possible, and that is I start my day with as many easy wins as possible. And what I mean by that is things that I know that I can get done and accomplish, I try to do those at the beginning of the day. Uh, because for me, the more I accomplish, the more that f- feeds my sense that uh, I-, I can get things done and need to get things done. Uh, on the other hand, when I, you know, if I start off my day with a hard problem that I really get bogged down in two, three hours trying to figure it, then my day is shot, and I usually don't get much else done. So, uh, you know, I try to I start my day. Uh, what are those little things, things I can start and finish in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, a short period of time, build that up uh, and kind of uh, build myself up uh, for a, uh, a productive day? Yeah, I usually start with first thing I do is, uh, is a glass of water. And then once I have that glass of water, everything starts to fall into place. But those three key things and defining those um in the morning and then knocking off the easiest ones first are definitely definitely the way to go, especially when the things like blizzards get in the way. <laughs> Absolutely. But if you could recommend one book for policymakers and others to read, what's one book you're recommending these days to basically everyone you meet? Um, this is a book called Obfuscation. Uh, and it's really not a commercial. It's really uh, uh, the fact that it is literally the last book uh, I read, and it's written by two of my colleagues in my department here at NYU, uh, Finn Brunton and Helen Nissenbaum. And what this book does, it, it's a great book, I think, for policymakers because it's really about the idea of data and privacy uh, online and uh, the other related sort of digital tools that we uh, use. And really what the authors are trying to do are show the ways in which, uh, you know, really internet technology has outpaced our policy thinking about how to uh, keep our data private, uh, how to keep control of our own data and information as individuals. And so what the book really does is talk about uh, sort of strategies for for privacy and making our uh, online footprint, our digital uh, tool usage, uh, something that we uh, continue to be uh, in control of or in control of as, uh, as much as possible. Charlton, thanks once again for joining me on the show. What are some final thoughts you'd like to leave with the audience and where can we find you online? Thank you, Joe. Um, this has been great uh, talking with you. Folks can find me online at charltonmcelwain.com charltonmcelwain.com. You can find me at uh, NYU, so just looking up my name, Googling my name, easy to find on Twitter, C. McElwain, C-M-C-I-L-W-A-I-N, so at C. McElwain on Twitter. And I would just say as a close that, uh, you know, we live in an environment uh, where 
Uh, you know, we we call it the real world, and that real world today is offline, it's online, it's connected to a variety of digital tools. Discussions about race are tough ones to have sometimes, but uh, I think rather than shying away from it, ignoring it, uh, I think we must continue to think about ways in which we can engage that discussion. Uh, and think about ways in which we can make our world, whether it's uh, about our neighborhoods or the neighborhoods we live in online, free from uh, discrimination uh, and making sure that they are uh, equal or as equal uh, as possible. Stay around open-minded people. You don't have to worry about anything. That's right. <laughs> but Charlton McElwain, Associate Professor of Media, Culture, and Communication and author of Race Appeal, How Candidates Invoke Race in U.S. Political Campaigns, which won the prestigious Ralph Bunch Award in 2012 and was recognized by the American Library Association and is one of the best books among academic publishers. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. That concludes episode 24 of the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you for listening. I cannot do any of this without you, so thank you. If you're new to the podcast or even if you've been listening for a while, I invite you to go over to iTunes, look up the Washington Tech Policy Podcast, and give us a quick rating and review. It'll take just a few seconds, maybe not even 30 seconds. Just give us, you know, tell us what you think. Give us your honest feedback on what you like about the show, what you don't like, because not only will it help us improve, it'll also help us rise through the ranks in iTunes. I can't tell you how important it is for those ratings and reviews to come in, so I'd greatly appreciate that. Thanks again to all of you for listening. I will see you back here next week. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Washing Tech Policy Podcast. You've been briefed. 